Well, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you to the third quasi-biennial uh, meeting, colloquium. Uh, my name is Rick Hooper. I'm the, the president of, of Quasi. Uh, it's great to see many of you back again. Um, Effie, we've done it now the third time. Effie was here for the first, first meeting to put this together. Um, and so I hope as you walk in, you see this isn't a normal meeting. Uh, we hope to make this a much more relaxed atmosphere as evidenced by the, the fact that we're not in, in theater style, but you have tables. It was kind of a, a, a happenstance, an accident the first year, uh, but uh, we found that it really helps the meeting because when you sit down at a table, you tend to introduce yourself to other people at a table. And uh, it really changes the whole nature of the, of the meeting. So I encourage you to, um, uh, yeah, to interact. That's the point of this meeting. Uh, there's lots of time uh, for, for discussion, uh, and, and I encourage the, the younger colleagues to not be bashful and uh, go approach the, uh, the ones you don't know and introduce yourself and, and initiate some conversations. So again, uh, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, I feel like we're, we're on the map now of doing this three times. Uh, a few quick acknowledgments. First to, to NCAR for the use of this a wonderful facility. Um, we keep on thinking about trying to do it someplace else, but this is really so perfect it's difficult to, to move somewhere else. Um, to the staff, uh, you've met, probably met Kayla out at the, the um, registration desk, uh, staff of Quasi. We've had quite a few uh, uh, turnover in staff in the last few years, so there's new people to meet. Uh, Kayla uh, you know, deserves a lot of thanks for trying to organize the meeting. Uh, Jennifer's in the back there. Uh, John Pollock is around as well, so please, uh, when you see them, introduce yourself. We're, we're here to uh, assist the community. Um, and then, let me see, anybody else I'm forgetting now? Probably I'm forgetting somebody, but uh, uh, we will actually have a, a welcome tomorrow from um, the uh, Assistant Director of, of NCAR, um, who we couldn't make it this morning, will we'll be here tomorrow. I guess with that then, I will turn uh, the podium over to uh, Vitek Krajewski, who's the Chair of the Board of Quasi. Thanks. I know the other announcements, logistical announcements. Sorry, now I remember the logistical announcements that's what I'm supposed to make. First, there is um, the banquet tomorrow evening followed by the film. The banquet tickets are $25. There are tickets available if you haven't done that yet. See Kayla and you can do it. But regardless of whether you come to the banquet or not, you're welcome to come to the film afterwards. Uh, we have the um, honor of having the director of, of the film, the last call at the Oasis, uh, with us. She'll be speaking uh, before the film. Uh, so I really would encourage you to come. It's an example of, of a water documentary, a very recent, recently released one. Uh, Jay Famietti, otherwise known as Mr. Hollywood, is prominently in the, in the film. Um, so you can uh, touch a star while you're here. Um, and it's, it's really important, quite in a serious way, it's, it's important because of um, seeing how water science is being um, uh, uh, transmitted, communicated to the public. Uh, with that, you also notice there's a, a table outside with the Let's Talk About Water, so you can talk with, uh, uh, talk with Linda uh, about uh, some challenge grants that we have if you're interested in doing a water and film event on your campus. More information out there. Uh, let me see what else is it. Logistics, you should have in the back of your uh, name tag two drink, it, drink tickets for this afternoon for the reception, for the poster reception. If you bought a banquet ticket, you should have a banquet ticket there. If you don't, again, see Kayla, because we probably screwed up somehow. It's eminently possible. Um, so just check to see whether you have it. But anyway, don't lose your, your uh, badge, because the important thing are the drink tickets that are in the back there. Um, let me see. Anything else I'm forgetting, Jennifer, for logistics? I think those are the most things. Uh, there is a clarification and a correction of what's on the website. Lunches are provided, but please eat breakfast at your hotel. Uh, that was a change this year that didn't get Hallway propagated through the, the website. So sorry for any, any um, misunderstanding about that. I think that's everything. So now, VTech. Good morning. So my name is Witold Krajewski. Um, I'm the current chair of the board of directors of Quasi. And Quasi is your organization. Um, this uh, uh, biennial meeting has quickly become uh, an important item in the portfolio of activities of QUASI. Uh, it is an opportunity uh, to get together and to share our uh, ideas, uh, research ideas and results uh, in a much less hectic environment, say, compared to, uh, to the typical AGU. 
Uh, it is also an opportunity to get to know each other. Um, and and uh, um, again, this is uh, something very important uh, because again, Quasi uh, represents you know, you. Uh, we combine this uh, biennial meeting with other activities, uh, short courses, workshops, uh, and also with a, a meeting of the board of directors. Uh, and uh, such a meeting was held over the weekend, you know, here. So you have several members of the board of directors uh, here present at the conference. As you know, the board of directors, uh, these are elected by you, officials. So therefore, they represent your interest, and therefore this meeting is an opportunity for you to provide input with respect to the future activities of the organization, the main purpose of which is to enhance your professional careers. Um, this meeting is also an opportunity for us to recognize uh, our colleagues with special lectures uh, and awards. Um, and. Uh, um, uh, and we will do so uh, throughout the conference. The program for this particular meeting was uh, developed and put together by Jim McNamara, a professor at Boise State University. And uh, Jim will tell you more about the program and he will also introduce uh, our keynote speaker. Jim, welcome and enjoy. Thank you and welcome for the third time. I'll just take a couple of uh, seconds of, of your time to introduce you to a little bit to the program. Each year we do select a theme from which the talks are mm, loosely, loosely organized around. More importantly, it's just to get the people together. It's, uh, for most, how many people have been here for the uh, other meetings? Yeah, so I think most of us, since you're returning, you can see quite a few returning. I always view it as if you take the, the poster session at AGU and just drop it into a, a nice environment and it's a, an opportunity for more interaction. And that's our main goal is interaction among colleagues. The theme this year we select is fusing science and solutions. And once again, it's loosely organized around the, excuse me, around the theme of connecting our research to policy and practice. And you can see the sessions of the titles that are, that, uh, are along, excuse me, along that theme. Also, we wanted to focus on using, um, figuring out how to more effectively use the uh, observatories that have been uh, blossoming around the country along that theme. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, just a, a quick tour. Uh, you'll see that the sessions are organized in two-hour blocks on each day, starting at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. And there are two concurrent sessions each time, um, and wrapping up uh, Wednesday noon. Tomorrow afternoon is a little bit different. The afternoon session uh, has is composed of two mini workshops one on the HIS system and one on uh, continuing and planning on observatories. And it's also an opportunity for if you're not involved in uh, those two initiatives for some free time. Uh, we kind of heard the last couple of times like, boy, uh, Boulder's such a nice place. It'd be nice to have some time to, to check out the area a little bit. So you're welcome to do that Tuesday afternoon. But we had a banquet that night to make sure that you come back and uh, get some food and uh, share some interaction. Uh, so the sessions, two hour blocks each, um, each day. Each morning begins with an address from our uh, plenary and keynote speakers. On Wednesday, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Saru Sarushian uh, delivering the Eagleson Lecture. On Tuesday, you'll hear from Dr. Tom Dunn delivering the Woolman Lecture. And today, uh, our keynote address is delivered by Dr. Roger Pilkey Jr., uh, a local, a professor at the uh, University of Colorado in Boulder in environmental science. He's also a fellow at the uh, Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Science. Uh, he is highly regarded for his research in interdis interdisciplinary climate research. He's received numerous awards in that area. Most recently, I think, uh, from an honorary doctorate degree from, oh, Linköping University in Sweden. Um, he's been on the faculty at uh, uh, UC Boulder since 2001. Uh, and today, he's going to speak to us on policy relevant science, a minefield where uncertainty, ignorance, and politics meet. Dr. Pilkey. Thanks, Jim. It's, it's great to be here, especially because I can wake up in my own bed and five minutes later be at a major international scientific conference. Um, I'm going to talk about this minefield, which um, I spent about the last 20 years uh, walking through, and I discovered it was a minefield along the way, but really not <laughs> until about 15 years into that process of walking through it. Um, the, the water sciences, I think, are particularly important uh, because 
this is a community that does cutting edge scientific research that is directly relevant to decisions that are made in a range of settings on a range of time scales. And there's really no avoiding uh, the connection with decision making. If you're working on the Higgs boson, maybe you can ignore the, the politics and the policy issues, uh, but you guys can't. And what I'm going to do in this talk is to present um, a number of cases. I'm actually going to present one case five different times um, that, that discusses some of the factors that arise um, when you're trying to quote unquote fuse science and decision making. Um, it's not so easy. Um, and it's, it's actually fraught with a lot of challenges. And I think in particular the, the earth sciences in general, um, but climate, water, weather are at a particular juncture where there are some systemic challenges to producing good, useful science for decision making. I'll explain that. Um, let me just say something about the title. Uh, I do think that this community does um, a very good job of considering issues of uncertainty, of discussing them, raising them, trying to quantify them. Um, maybe less so when it comes to ignorance, I'll define that. And uh, if this community is like my department, uh, issues of politics are somebody else's issue. Um, and I would simply say that if you're not spending as much time talking about ignorance uh, and politics as you are uncertainty, you're missing big parts of the puzzle. Um, I will use the laser pointer as I go through, but it's only going to be on this image. So here's my conclusions. Here's where I hope to wind up. Um, and let me say at the outset, um, I'm going to go through a lot of material, and I tend to go fast. Um, and I'll make some assertions that I don't have time to back up, but I promise I can back them all up. Um, and I'm going to give you a website at the end to my blog, and later today I'm going to post up references and um, information related to some of the claims I'm making today. And, if you're interested in continuing the discussion or challenging or raising questions that we can't get to in the Q&A after, please visit. I'm, I am more than happy to discuss, and um, there will be some controversial things I'll say today. Um, I don't think there's a lot of coffee out there, so maybe I can provoke you to be awake with, with some of that. Um, so here's my conclusions. Um, the best decision processes are those in which predictions do not matter. Uh, this is a very difficult message for people who are in the prediction business to understand because if decision makers do their job, they make you irrelevant. Um, uncertainty, and in particular ignorance, where we don't even know what the numbers are, um, are endemic in forecasting, not a surprise. We have incentives to make systematic errors in the use of predictions. And I'm going to illustrate that I think there are, every one of us could be doing our jobs exactly right, and we are contributing to a large scale failure in the use of predictions in decision making. I will explain that. Um, and to make these matters more complicated, most high stakes decisions, by definition, are infused with political considerations. And when I say political, don't put in your brain an image of Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. By political, I mean basically all of those values considerations that are beyond those that are scientific. It could be ego, it could be career, it could be money, it could be most anything. Um, there are no high stakes decisions that do not involve these considerations. So with that, as where I'm going, I'm going to go through a number of cases where all of these issues are present. So 1997 in uh, North Dakota, the Red River uh, flooded, it was record flooding at the time. Um, I uh, got called in as the, I was at NCAR actually at the time, as the, the external social scientist participant. At the time, National Weather Service had a requirement to include one social scientist on the disaster survey team, so I was the uh, social scientist. And if you take a look, this is downtown Grand Forks. Um, you guys are hydrologists, so you can probably see the river channel better than me, but it's something like this. Um, I'm going to show a picture that's taken right here on this bridge that goes right across the, the river here in a second, but that's to orient you. Uh, again, most of you guys know that the river flows from south to north. I'm going to focus on Grand Forks. Um, as I understand it, this is one of the flattest places on the surface of the earth, um, so you get a lot of water on it. It's like putting water on a table, and it moves around in different ways. Um, so th what happened, long story short, um, is that forecasting uh, became a central issue in this major flood, which at the time, and I think it's still correct today, was the, the, the most costly per capita disaster in US history. And that's one reason is because there's not many people there, but another is because it was a huge disaster. This was a flood that was anticipated months in advance. Um, in this region, the floods are snowmelt floods. Um, and you have some sense of how much snow is on the ground. And uh, what, was, what was so troubling about this is this was a flood that was very well anticipated months in advance that wound up having people evacuate hurriedly in, in the middle of the night. Now, 
this headline from uh, the, the Fargo Forum, which is not Grand Forks, but it's near there. Finger pointing begins in Forks. Mayor says, poor forecasting, doom city. Weather service says it gave its best effort. Um, it turns out, um, and I have a paper on this that explains all the details, but both of those statements are true. Um, the weather service did give its best effort and forecast doom the city. Now, was it a bad forecast? For months in advance, the weather service was forecasting 49 feet. Now, this is that bridge I showed you. Imagine it going across here. Um, 49 feet, look at the bridge. 49 feet, wow, that's close to the roadway, but it's not a disaster. Um, in fact, the flood of record um, at, at the time, uh, was from 1979, was, was 48.8 feet. And the weather service, well, with, a mess, with 49 feet, what we were trying to explain to people was gonna be the worst flood ever. What people heard was, that's only four inches higher than what we had in 1979. That wasn't so bad. Um, so actually the message that was sent was opposite the message that was received. Now, it actually crested at 54 feet. Now, the question that you could ask was, was this a bad forecast? And if you take a look, it's just here's one way. There's a lot of ways to evaluate forecasts. This is uh, forecast errors uh, for different locations. East Grand Forks is in red. This was the, the forecast error, a 10%. Uh, underestimate. If you take all of the years that forecasts were issued up to 1997 and you take the average, the average was 10 percent. So this was well within the historical error in such forecasts. What the Weather Service did not do was put out any information on uncertainty in their forecasts. Now this is from my memory. This is not an accurate depiction, but as a, a, a social scientist I had a chance to interview almost all the main players in this disaster. And this is my memory's recollection of the mayor of East Grand Forks. And here I am going in as a smart aleck, young social scientist from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and I say to him, wouldn't you want the Weather Service to provide you a full distribution of uncertainties, um, recognizing that they probably can't get this right to plus or minus 10%, which would be 44 to 54 feet. And his response, and I'm paraphrasing, was, hell no. I want the Weather Service to give me one number and stand behind it. Why was that? Because that one number dictates what decisions he has to make. If you give a range, then the decision maker has to then go within that range and use some judgment and decide how do I want to be wrong? On which side do I want to err? Because it's gonna, make, it's gonna cost one way or the other. If the Weather Service gives one number, then he can say, well, they told me to do it. This is what happened in that case. Now, my education was not over at that time. I went to the National Weather Service. This was afterwards. And I said, I have a great idea. There's this thing called the internet. This is 1997. You could put up all of your historical forecasts and their errors on the internet and advertise it to your end users. So they have a sense of what the uncertainty is. The response I got was, no, we don't want to do that because we don't want people to lose faith in the accuracy of our forecasts. So on both sides, there was profound incentives not to recognize uncertainties and ignorance. Uh, now, what happened in Grand Forks? Since then, a lot of the flooded area in 1997 was turned into parks. They, they, they uh, worked on the channel. Um, they've had floods that have exceeded that. It's not an issue now. They have made the forecast irrelevant. Um, so in that sense, this is a success story. But the story that I'm telling has repeated over and over again. So let's, let's go around the world. More recently, this is the Wyvenhoe Dam near Brisbane, Australia, um, which if there's anyone, any students here looking for a doctoral dissertation topic, you will not find a better topic than the management of the Wyvenhoe Dam um, last year. Um, this, this is a, a dam that was built after 1974 floods um, to serve two purposes, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these conflicting purposes. One is to prevent floods, and the other is to store water for when there's droughts. Uh, so in this case, uh, in a very similar fashion to what happened in Grand Forks, um, you had this water accumulating, it was La Nina rains um, in this part of Australia, uh, and then in emergency fashion, the water had been accumulating for some time, but in emergency fashion, uh, water had to be let out of the dam or else it was going to spill over the top. That emergency release of water led to a big pulse that flooded Brisbane. Uh, causing five to ten billion dollars in damage. Uh, it's not unprecedented, it's a major flood, the largest one since 1974. Um, since it happened, one of the questions that was raised was why did this flood occur? Was it avoidable? 
And this is where things get very interesting. Now, there were issues on all time scales of using forecasts. These are the short term forecasts uh, that were made. Uh, official government forecast in Australia. Forecast is in blue. These are different days in January. The flood was uh, 10th, 11th. And you see on the days right before the flood that the short term uh, forecast underestimated the amount of rain that fell. Then apparently they said, well, we're, <laughs> we're going to err on the other side uh, on this next day. The issue here was not that the forecasts were in some sense wrong. Um, whatever that might be. Um, the issue here was that the forecasts were not even used. Uh, this is from uh, a hydrologist at Macquarie University who wrote a fascinating uh, evaluation. Um, and he talks about the agency that manages the dam. Um, and they wrote a, a report um, that justified how they make decisions that said, uh, precipitation forecasts were not sufficiently reliable to form the basis of operational decision making for the dam. Uh, Thus, this less than perfect information was given zero weight and not used at all to help predict reservoir levels. Effectively, a forecast of zero rainfall was used to inform decisions about water release strategies. In other words, under the circumstances, it seems that the operators chose a scenario guaranteed to be wrong over a forecast that was likely to be uncertain. It's a very similar dynamic to we see the, uh, the, the mayor from East Grand Forks. If you specify what information you're going to use, it dictates your decision strategy. There's no discretion, no judgment, no accountability, no responsibility. It gets even more complicated. So Australia had been experiencing a very long period of drought in the context of a very public debate over human-caused climate change and a carbon tax. Um, this is one of the engineers who worked on the dam who immediately afterwards said, uh, put it this way, you would have to have very large balls to significantly reduce the dam's volumes in the months after the weather warnings after 10 years of drought. Because if you had got it wrong, you would be accused of wasting the water. So the water was viewed as a precious resource and releasing it in the days leading up to the flood was apparently viewed as uh, something that would involve large costs. Because what if you release all that water and it didn't rain? Uh, so there's long term consideration. Now, the, obviously, the only way to, to deal with this problem is to build storage large enough that can store enough water and prevent floods, but that costs a lot of money, and it involves environmental and other considerations. That's not it. There was a scandal. It's still unfolding in Australia. Um, everything was fine until the Australian, which is a newspaper, started poking their nose into uh, the decision-making process. Um, and long story short, they found that the managers of the dam um, were operating in an ad hoc, seat of their pants manner during the days of the flood, and later falsified the event reports uh, to show that they did something that they didn't actually do. Um, so all through this process, long term, short term, um, how you conform to a flood uh, operations manual, and so on, um, there were decision errors that were made. So I don't know the answer to the question, could the flooding of Brisbane been avoided? Could it have been mitigated? Uh, but that would seem to be an important question to resolve going forward um, for the management, not just of the Wyvenhoe Dam, but for others. So the conclusion here is that the most effective decision processes are those which are robust to predictive uncertainties. This is not a statement about the state of the science. This is a statement about how we make decisions and a lot of the incentives that are involved with how we make decisions, both scientifically and politically. Um, if we make predictions irrelevant, we take that off the table. Now let me explore a case study in which um, we tried to quantify some uncertainties associated with hurricane damage. Uh, and we asked the question, uh, if you're given a specific projection of future changes to hurricane behavior, uh, when would we be able to identify a trend in the economic loss data as a consequence of those changes? So what we're doing is we're just positing the change. We're assuming it, that it's real. We're not questioning that. But we're simply saying, when would you be able to detect it? And I know there's some good research, good literature in hydrology that looks at this same question. Um, the analogy here is um, you're playing a game of poker. And you suspect that somebody is stacking the deck. What playing strategies do you adopt in this sort of a situation? So the answer to this question is we'll be able to detect the changes that are currently projected in state-of-the-art climate models uh, for hurricane behavior um, in 260 years. 
Yes, there's some uncertainty around this number, 120 to 550 years. Um, Carrie Emanuel at MIT um, replicated our study using a much more aggressive set of assumptions about hurricane landfalls and hurricane behavior. Um, and his midpoint was 120 years. So qualitatively, the story is, in our lifetimes, we are not going to have any certainty on trends in economic damages related to hurricanes um, under all scenarios that are currently being looked at uh, by the climate community. Uh, so what this shows, and this will be important for the next two parts of uh, the talk, um, we've done some work to ask the question, if, if historical hurricanes hit the United States with today's level of development and property values, what would the damage be? Um, here's Katrina approaching 125 billion. Um, these are 2005 values. There's, Katrina is actually closer to 180 billion now. This is 1926 Miami. Here's a moving average. There's no trend in the data. Um, if you look at landfalls, uh, this is historical U.S. landfalls. There's no trend in that data either. It's a stationary time series. So what we did is we took um, results from uh, Morris Bender, who's at GFDL, and colleagues um, who did a study. It was published in Science in 2010. It was viewed to be uh, the state of the art in, in uh, climate modeling. And they project an increase, 81% um, increase in the most powerful storms over 80 years, which is a lot. It's a big number. They find, they define this term, the emergence time scale. When would you be able to detect that trend in, the, in the, the data on hurricanes? They find 60 years. Now, our numbers are much longer because we're adding a, another process on top of that, which is the damage function. So what we did is we did a Monte Carlo simulation of damage. There's some that have sharp increases, smaller increases, no increases few that have downward trends. And we said the emergence time scale is the time it takes for 95% of our simulations uh, to show a, an increase. Um, and that's where we get this 260 year number. What that means is that if you are looking to observations of damage from extreme events, and I would generalize this to floods and droughts and wildfires, um, and you're looking at the societal impacts, uh, we are not going to have anything close to certainty as defined in terms of statistical significance on our lifetimes, which means we are going to be operating in a zone of ignorance. We just don't know. So what do you do when you're ignorant? So let's go back to our card game. Um, what strategy should you use? And the very frustrating thing about this is when you talk about decision making, there is not a single right answer. Um, what I would say is that you be informed as you're playing the game about a number of things. One is your expectations. What do you think is going to happen with respect to hurricane landfall, frequency and intensity? Why do you think what you think? Um, what do you think about changing exposure and vulnerability, where we're going to build, how much we're going to build? Um, how does event incidents compare to exposure and vulnerability? And then explore the consequences of those expectations for signal detection. Um, when do, will you know uh, whether you're right or not? And decision evaluation, and I'll get into this in a second. Were you, were you lucky in your decision making? Um, or were you really good? Were you skillful in making decisions? What happens a lot of times is in situations of ignorance, we map all of those other values onto our science. So we think that you know I'm risk averse, so I don't really want to lose a lot of money in my insurance portfolio. So that's going to lead me to project a lot more storms in the future. If I do that, I'm not really saying anything about the storms. I'm just saying something about my risk preferences. And for this community, being able to clearly distinguish what the science can say empirically versus what we would like decision outcomes to, to be turns out to be a very difficult thing to do in practice. So this is really um, the core of my, my presentation. And it's, um, I think, an endemic and systematic problem in the earth sciences community. It's one that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Um, and I've titled it, um, The Hot Hand Fallacy Meets the Guaranteed Winner Scam. And I'll explain these in some detail. So the guaranteed winner scam. Imagine that this is a room of 512 people. And I tell you I'm going to predict the winner of the football game this weekend. And half of you I tell it's going to be the Denver Broncos, the other half, I say it's going to be the Dallas Cowboys. All right? For half of you, it's 100% certainty that I will be correct. All right? 256 of you are going to get the, the correct prediction. Now, let's say I do that again. 
the next week. And I divide that group into half, 128, 128, and I issue predictions. Um, if I start with a large enough set of people, I can get up to seven, eight, nine correct predictions in a row for some subset of that community. And you'll say, this guy is a genius. Then I show up and I say, all right, I'm going to give you my eighth prediction, but it's going to cost you. How much would you be willing to pay? Probably more than zero. In fact, there's a study that just came out. Um, it has nothing to do with earth sciences or anything, but um, these scholars who are in Germany, what they wanted to do was explore why people pay for useless advice. So what they did is they, they, they took their subjects and they asked their subjects, could you give me a coin from your own pocket? So that's so they know that the coin's not a biased coin. All right, so you give me a coin and I flip it. And they did this, this guaranteed winner scam where they divided them up into two groups. And it turns out people are willing to pay, their willingness to pay for a prediction increases by 5% for each correct prediction. What this says, and even though, and then what they found is people understand probability. It's not that people don't understand probability. It's that people have this view that if you are making, if you compared the prediction with the realization and there's some conformity there, then you must have skill in your ability to predict. Now, what we've done in our community, in our communities, is that we have so many people producing so many models with so many runs, is that we have created a community-wide guaranteed winner scam. So that every time there's an event, maybe it's Bear Peak on fire here in Boulder a few weeks ago, maybe it's a big flood in Japan, who knows? Could be any event in the real world. It is possible for us to look at that event and then go back to somebody's model run and say, aha, that was predicted. Now, if it happens to be you who issued that prediction, you're not gonna say, well, you know, maybe I'm just the, the, the one eighth of the community that, that happened to get that correct. Um, you'll say, damn straight I have skill. Look at the physics underlying my model. <laughs> um, this gets played out in the media. It gets played out. And I, I think this is something that we do not, and I say we as a community, do not do as good a job as we should in creating systematic tests, um, out of sample tests for the skill of the predictions we issue. Um, we have um, we have fallen trapped to this hot hand fallacy. I'll explain that. That is, I think, poorly named. It's named uh, from a study of shooting uh, baskets in professional basketball games. Um, that the idea that if you have any long-term stochastic process, you're going to have runs in there um, where a player makes 10 baskets in a row. And the, what you know, players say is, get it to the guy with the hot hand. Uh, and they, they call it the hot hand fallacy because maybe he's just being lucky. Um, I actually think basketball players do have hot hands. Um, so maybe it's, you're at the craps table, use that as an example. But what we do in this community is we, I think, more than we care to admit, fall prey to the hot hand fallacy in the context of this guaranteed winner scam. Um, and it is made even worse because there's media attention, there's the overlay of climate politics, um, there's funding at stake. Uh, I had a, a student, um, it's been a while ago, um, catalog all of the forecasts that were made in the United States um, by, uh, by NOAA, by the National Weather Service, um, and, and our catalog had hundreds of thousands of forecasts on different time scales, um, and so we created a, a little web browser. If you wanted to type in southwestern United States and ENSO, um, you could come up with 475 forecasts that are made. Um, the disciplines of the social sciences, particularly psychology and uh, drug trials, have found their own moment where they've realized that they have these systematic uh, discipline-wide biases. Um, there's a, a well-known feature to um, social science research where, where research results wear off. That if you do enough studies looking at relationships between two variables, you're going to have a few that show up with spurious results. Um, and what happens is when you replicate those, those nice strong findings you found um, originally don't hold up. But what happens in these communities is if you have non-findings, they're generally not publishable. So what's published are those strong spurious results. Um, Nature, you can look this up just two weeks ago or three weeks ago, had a, a very nice and very provocative study um, where one of the major drug companies uh, tried to replicate 54 
studies that showed a relationship between a drug intervention and a health outcome. And they found they could only replicate four of the 54 studies. Um, I think our community is slowly catching up to this, and emphasis on slowly, but this, it, it, and for this to occur, everyone could be doing their job perfectly in our community. So this is not a story of doing bad science. This is how good science leads to very difficult situations. Now, okay, so I say this, it sounds great, it's interesting. I'm gonna show how it operates in practice in a real world case with important consequences. So I'm gonna return to the hurricane damage forecast. Um, after Hurricane Katrina hit big, huge damage, um, one of the questions that was raised was, are we in a new era? Is every year going to be like this? Are, are, are there going to be more damages because of climate change and so on? Um, Al Gore's movie came out, had a hurricane coming out of a smokestack. Um, so what, uh, let me take a step back. In the insurance and reinsurance industry, there are a group of companies called catastrophe modelers um, who provide software. It's very useful. It helps to, to give you some sense of what damage is going to be if an event occurs. Um, but they made a very important change uh, in the spring of 2006, so right after the 2005 hurricane season, um, they changed their models such that they predicted a 40% increase in uh, damages over the next five years, so from 2006 to 2010. This led to a dramatic increase in the cost of insurance, the cost of reinsurance. Um, I'll show you an example from uh, an investigative reporting story that said that residents of Florida paid $82 billion in additional insurance premium over 2006 to 2010 based on this one change in the models. Now, if you have this long time series, I give this to you, and I'm sure there's a lot of really sophisticated statisticians in here, what would you do? to project the next five years, and what would you share with a decision maker? So here's the overprediction. Um, here's the leading company, Risk Management Solutions. Here's their prediction of damage, $90 billion over five-year period. Here's the historical average from our data set. Here's the actual damage. So in technical terms, you would say their prediction lacked skill. Now, how did they produce their prediction? And this is where it gets very interesting, and this is where the guaranteed winner scam, hot hand fallacy, come into play. What they did is they put together an ensemble of 20 different models. You don't have to see this. I've put the numbers over here. Um, they're statistical models. They're dynamical models. And a few are based on climatology um, to project what the future landfall incidents will be of, uh, of hurricanes. And what matters most for hurricanes are the intense hurricanes, category three, four, and five. They cause 85 to 90% of the damage. One thing you'll recognize in their models that they present, the lowest value is climatology. So this is just a historical record of landfalls. All of the others are much higher than climatology. So any process you would use to integrate these models to come up with a single number is by definition going to be higher than climatology. Now so you may ask, well, what's the basis for where these numbers come from? Um, and it turns out, and I'll get to this in a few slides, but all of the action is not in what experts think about these models, but how you choose to combine them. So as uh, Mother Nature has um, a funny sense of humor, um, after the 2005 hurricane season, we have not in the United States seen an intense hurricane make landfall. Um, we are in, currently in the longest period of no intense hurricanes ever recorded, um, which goes back to at least 1900. Um, and, that, uh, and if you're you know, gambling, you want to play the stock market, and it, baseline expectation is a 30% chance in a year. So uh, we still have 90% of the hurricane season ahead of us, so maybe it'll get broken this year, maybe not. Uh, but clearly, the expectation that there was a significant increase in the landfall rate going forward um, didn't work. Or did it work? They, or their just realization was at the tail of the distribution. Um, there's no way of actually knowing. So here's those 20 models that they put together. Um, the actual number is zero. So which one of these models was best? Uh, the, the folks, particularly in this company, but in this industry, are very prickly when you start talking about these issues. Um, in 2008, I had the opportunity, um, which I'm sure they 
regret now to participate in their expert elicitation process to come up with the single number that goes into the models. And the way that that process worked is I was uh, seven other scientists, Michael Mann was one, Judy Curry was another, um, Tom Knudsen. Um, and we sat around a table, they brought us to Miami, we sat around a table, and they gave us each a pile of tiddlywinks, little chips. And we went through this, this process that was led by an elicitor to allocate our tiddlywinks across these models in a way that we thought best represented the science. And then what they did is they added up the 800 tiddlywinks from the eight experts and they weighed these models. Guess what the result was? The result was the average of all of these numbers. So the Sarasota Herald Tribune won the Pulitzer Prize for looking into this issue. And I, I just th thought um, reading this um, small excerpt from that is pretty important because it, it starts to tell us that the impact of forecasts can be larger than the things that we care about forecasting about. So Hurricane Katrina extracted a terrifying toll. 1,200 dead, a premier American city in ruins, the nation in shock. Insured losses would ultimately cost the property insurance industry $40 billion. But Katrina did not tear a hole in the financial structure of America's property insurance as large as the one carved scarcely six weeks later by a largely unknown company called Risk Management Solutions. Instead of using 100 years of history to calculate the average number of storms each year, RMS used the scientists' work as the basis for a new crystal ball, a computer model that would estimate storms for the next five years. The change created an $82 billion gap between the money insurers had and what they needed, a hole they spent the next five years trying to fill with rate increases and policy cancellations. RMS said the change that drove Florida's property insurance bills to record highs was based on scientific consensus. So again, here's an example where whether they're risk averse or not is getting mapped on to the science. Now, after I participated in the 2008 process, um, I wrote a number of blog posts and articles explaining that um, this is us, the expert elicitors, um, that a bunch of monkeys, and I've been corrected that chimpanzees are not monkeys, but um, that a bunch of monkeys could come up with the exact same results because we really had no basis for allocating across these models. So of course it was more or less random and the average of the 20 model spread was where all the action was. So I'm not saying RMS did that, but if they wanted to manipulate the process, uh, they would just change their selection of models. Now it turns out the year that we did the expert elicitation in 2008, um, they used instead of these 20 models, it had expanded to over 30. And when we went through the expert elicitation process, we came up with a landfall rate that was 10% less than what they had found the previous year. Now that's a problem because 10% less means that insurance rates would go down. Uh, the reason why that, and I have not been able to get the numbers, and I suspect that if the numbers disproved what I'm arguing, the RMS would have provided them, my argument was that when they went from 20 models to more than 30, the average of the set went down by 10%. So they actually, actually scored an own goal on themselves. Uh, after 2008, they stopped their expert elicitation process. <laughs> this is an example, though, of how none of us have any ability to discern among these models. This is made more difficult because maybe we have a non-stationary process, maybe we don't, but if we're playing poker, we're only dealing a hand every five years. So by the time you get enough accumulated experience to know which one of your models has skill, we've moved on. Decisions have been made. If we're in a non-stationary process, we will never know which model is best. This is a situation of fundamental and irreducible ignorance. Um, I would say this is a case where science and decision making was well fused in a very destructive and bad way. So there's a lot we can do to make science relevant to decision making that does not necessarily mean that decisions will be well made. Now in this industry there's again another overlay of external factors. Um, in this case the catastrophe modeling firm puts out its outlook which is adopted by insurance and reinsurance companies who take money from homeowners and businesses, they set their premiums, and then they pay the catastrophe modeling firms. So even though there may not be any explicit bias, this is a little bit like the ratings agencies issues in the global financial crisis where there's an unhealthy relationship um, 
financial relationship between those people who are issuing these forecasts and those people who benefit from it. All right, in my last section, I'm going to talk about how the politics of these issues can become very personal. And it becomes, I, I don't have a good answer for what this sets up. Um, and this is the case whether we're talking about the Wyvenhoe Dam or reinsurance decision making or the global climate change debate. Um, in that all of us, when we put science out there into the real world, we become part of the story, part of the decision making process. Um, and we have to come up with good ways as a community to deal with that. Um, in the case of climate change, uh, the community, I would argue, has not done so well. Um, so this is just to set it up. This was, um, uh, there's a website called Climate Central, and one of their writers, uh, Mike Lemonick, wrote an article um, for scientists asking, where's the right balance between telling the whole truth and being truthful in an effective way? Where effective refers to compelling certain political outcomes out there in the big climate debate. This sets up a very difficult situation for those of us who are in the business of trying to make decisions. So I would equate this to the National Weather Service in 1997 in Grand Forks saying, we want people to be motivated to be concerned, so we're going to make it 49 feet because that's higher than the flood of record. And the actual effect of that number was the opposite. So using science as a tool to get effective action, um, you may want to question whether balancing whole truth is where you want to go. So what I'm going to do is just go through very quickly my experience with, um, and this is just a very small part of this story, of the science of disasters and climate change um, in the 2007 IPCC report, which actually, and I'll get to this, the IPCC is still uh, fumbling with. Um, so the IPCC 2007 report came out, working group two on the impacts of climate change, and like any self-centered scientist, I went to the IPCC and said, you know, where do they do with my stuff? So I went to the section of disasters and hazards um, and looked at what they said. Global losses reveal rapidly rising costs due to extreme weather events since the 1970s. One study has found that while the dominant signal remains that of the significant increases in the values of exposure at risk, once losses are normalized for exposure, there still remains an underlying rising trend. Now let me take a step back. Um, if you're not familiar with my work, um, along with Chris Lansley, we introduced this term normalization into the literature in 1997. Um, and all of the studies that have been done have found once you normalize for exposure, there's no residual economic loss trend. So here I am, who thinking I'm an expert on this, and there's one study. How could I have missed it? What, what was that one study? So there was a hint when if you go into the report, there's this graph. And this graph shows temperature anomaly is the red curve, and this greenish curve is catastrophe losses. And the implication here, I'm sure there's a lot of statisticians who could tell us, but the implication here is there's some relationship between the two. And that's implied in the text. This graph appears in the report. I'd never seen it. So if you take a look, my detective work, not very sophisticated. I saw what they referenced. <laughs> Muir Wood et al, 2006. I said, hmm, that sounds familiar. Went to the bibliography. Robert Muir Wood, this Miller, A. Boissonnot. Search for trends in a global catalog of normalized weather-related catastrophe losses. Workshop on climate change and disaster losses, understanding attributing trends and projections, Ho and Commer. I said, well, damn, that sounds familiar, because I organized that workshop. Um, <laughs> this was a workshop that um, I organized with Peter Hoppe at Munich Reinsurance um, as input to the IPCC to bring together scholars from around the world to actually address this issue of rising costs of disasters and whether we could detect any climate signal or human-caused climate change signal in that. Uh, increasing costs. Um, one of the advantages of working with Munich Re is they own a castle, um, and so our workshop was held here outside of Munich, 2006. It was a great workshop, um, co-sponsored by the NSF, um, German Research Institute, um, Munich Reinsurance, a UK research institute. 32 participants from 16 countries. We had 24 background white papers. So this Muir Wood paper that was cited was one of our background papers. We came up with a summary consensus report. Um, we originally thought we would have a consensus dissensus report. We would agree where we disagree. Turns out everyone agreed. The science was so clear cut on this topic. Everything that we said was consistent with and remains consistent with uh, working group one of the IPCC. Here are some of our take home messages, but the, the most important from what I'm telling you now is this in red. 
Um, it is still not possible to determine the portion of the increase in damages that might be attributed to climate change due to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the IPCC recently, in its report, the SREX report that came out a few months ago, actually finally came to this judgment. Um, but what I thought was interesting is that this graph that the IPCC had included, which was cited to Muir Wood, did not appear in Muir Wood's paper. Neither did the data. The paper didn't say anything. It was about data quality as related to historical uh, losses. So that raised some questions. Um, if I had more time, I'd go through the, the gory details. Um, but the graph from the IPCC does not appear in Muirwood 2006, nor does the underlying data. Um, I debated Robert Muirwood um, in London in 2010 after the IPCC issues came to the fore, and he told the audience that he personally had created the graph, included it in the IPCC, and intentionally miscited it so that he could circumvent their deadline for inclusion of published material. Why? They were working on a paper, and he expected that this graph would eventually appear in that paper. Um, I will say more about that in a second. This is, so Robert Muirwood was the IPCC lead author who was writing the report, put this in there. Um, as it turns out, he works for that same company I was just talking about, Risk Management Solutions. Um, at the exact same time he was writing this, they predicted the risk of US hurricane damage had increased by 40%. You just heard that story. So when they eventually published their paper, which took until 2008, they said the opposite of what he had anticipated they would say. We find insufficient evidence to claim a statistical relationship between global temperature increase and normalized catastrophe losses. Whoops. So when all of this was going on, this was with the IPCC glacier error and the, you know, all the frenzy and people attacking the IPCC. Um, the London Times did a story, which was an excellent story. They got everything right. Um, UN wrongly linked global warming to natural disasters. Uh, the IPCC, um, asked me earlier this year if I would submit an error correction request to them for, on this graph, um, which I said I have better things to do um, than deal with the IPCC. So Chris Field, to his credit, who's the head of Working Group 2, actually submitted an error correction protocol. And they contacted me two weeks ago and said that they're arguing internally over whether it represents a mistake or not. So I'm glad I didn't participate in that. Robert Muir Wood, in hindsight, says personally, I don't think the graph should have been there. Uh, but here's where all of this comes to make my point. Um, immediately after this London Times article came out, the IPCC, in kind of an odd fashion, because it's supposed to be a scientific organization, put out a press release. Um, they said the Sunday Times ran a misleading and baseless attack. Um, it's a balanced treatment of a complicated and important issue. They repeat it. So this is in 2010. This is after the Muir Wood paper was published, so there's really no excuses at this point. One study detected an increase in economic losses corrected for values at risk, but other studies have not detected such a trend. That was simply wrong. Um, I won't talk about their procedures, but the peer review process, this was caught in the peer review process um, and didn't get corrected. So just two weeks later, I find my name on the internet in the Foreign Policy Guide to Climate Skeptics. This is a foreign policy which doesn't do anything on climate. They don't know anything about water, weather, or climate, but it is a widely read public intellectual journal. And here I am, Roger Pelkey Jr., prominently featured FP Guide to Climate Skeptics, which then finds home all over the internet, shared around, still cited to this day um, when people protest me talking at events like this. So what's the problem? Well, it's hurricanes in the bottom line, the telling quote we cannot make a causal, causal link between the increase in greenhouse gases and the cost of damage associated with hurricane floods and extreme weather phenomena. The IPCC just concluded that also. For his work questioning certain graphs presented in IPCC reports, Pelkey has been accused by some of being a climate change denier. Ooh. <laughs> so this is where it's inescapable. All right? There's a political overlay on your science if your science matters. So if you're a hydrologist, and you happen to live in Australia right now, and you put out a report on the management of the Wyvernhoe Dam, you won't be called a climate denier probably, but you might be called something else. There's no escape for this. Now, the way that this community, our scientific community, ought to deal with these sorts of issues is through processes like the IPCC. But what happens if the IPCC itself is unable to deal with the politics surrounding these issues because 
an issue is popular or they won a Nobel Prize or whatever, then we have a chance of these systemic problems related to politics. All right, so I'm at the end. Um, and hopefully these make more sense now. Um, the best decision processes are those in which predictions don't matter. Um, uncertainty and ignorance, and I would emphasize ignorance, are endemic in forecasting. Uh, we have incentives to make systematic errors in the use of predictions, and by that I mean specifically the guaranteed winner scam meets the hot hand fallacy. And to make these matters more complicated, um, all of these decisions that we're making involve extra scientific considerations that go from everything from the personal level to the institutional to the government to private sector. And there's no hope, I think, to successfully fuse science with decision making if we in the academic and the scientific community aren't fully cognizant and aware of how to present our science in that minefield. So here's how you can find me, Pelkey at colorado.edu. Um, I welcome emails, comments, criticisms. Um, I tend to be responsive. Um, there's a bunch of papers implicated by this talk that you can find that are all downloadable. And later today, as I promised on my blog, rogerpelkeyjr.blogspot.com, I'll just put up a list of uh, past blog posts, peer-reviewed papers, um, and references to claims that I made here so that you can see that uh, at least I think they can all be supported. So thank you very much. All right. <laughs> I should know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this, this, the, the question is, you know, how does this regulate it and overseen? Um, there's a few issues here. Number one, I'm not sure um, that there were overpayments made. And there's a difference between arguing that there's overpayments made versus they were misjustified. And um, the, the, I have a grad student who's working on the uh, citizens um, reinsurance program in Florida, which has basically taken over um, being the insurer of last resort for Florida. And, uh, you can make a case, and it depends, again, on politically where you want to be on that risk aversion, risk exposed spectrum, um, that, that the, the reserves aren't large enough. Um, the problem is the basis for which you would justify it. And justifying it in terms of science then diminishes the role of science. Science just becomes a tool of advertising. Now, in Florida, it's difficult because um, the, the process of regulating insurance is uh, democratic in the sense that the insurance commissioner is an elected official. So, yes, it's very popular to campaign and say, I will reduce your insurance rates. Um, whether that's responsible or not is another question. Now, it gets even more complicated because companies and states and others that make decisions based on these model projections have to go through the ratings agencies, Standards and Poor's, Fitch's, and so on. Um, and how do they evaluate whether your risk estimates produced using these models are good ones or not? They use the exact same models. So it's like a circular loop where no, nothing's touching the ground. Um, so the question I've had for a long time, um, if you look at the subprime mortgage failure, you can say, yes, the systematic inability to accurately characterize risk of default was a central problem in the global financial crisis. Is there a problem in reinsurance other than a bunch of guys in Bermudas are getting stinking rich? Um, but, you know, if there's a disaster, the government will pay it out. And besides, disasters are not that expensive, right? $100 billion in the largest possible insured hurricane loss that we can imagine versus $1.8 trillion in the mortgage meltdown. So I'm not sure it even matters. And that all of our science in this case may just be there for uh, show, which makes regulation, I think, really difficult. In the back over there.
Yeah, you know, I, I, I think um, overall I agree 100% with what you said. Um, we talk about in our book, Prediction, um, those circumstances in which you would want to rely on predictions. Um, and there are certain situations, um, and those are those that are stationary processes where you have an opportunity to gain a lot of experience and you have the ability to, in your decision practice, um, processes to finally manage risk, which is a fairly small set of sophisticated decision makers. So I do agree, if you're managing a reservoir, if you're managing power load based on daily temperature forecasts, um, you can get closer to optimizing. One of the problems I see is that um, in, the, in the literature, um, if you look at literature on, on the use and value of forecasts, um, oftentimes the, the phrase in the long term is raised, uh, which makes great sense in theory. But if you look at how we make decisions related to insurance or reservoirs or whatever, we don't live in the long term. We make short term decisions and then if we screw up, we change the decision process all around. So um, we don't have that opportunity. And so um, I think that there's, um, an important subset of cases where relying on predictions makes an awful lot of sense. Um, and there's a lot of cases where we try to rely on decisions or we try to get decision makers to rely on our predictions um, when the best decision would be to help them become robust. And that's the difference I want to distinguish. Effie. So, so I'll, I'll illustrate this, and this, this comes up, and um, you know, I've given this, this versions of this talk for, for years, and people in the scientific community, if they don't throw something at me, they say, well, what do I do then? Um, and let's say you have, um, you have a $10 million research budget. Let's say you're NCAR, and you can invest that in computer modeling to generate predictions. One thing you might say you're going to do is we're going to get this, a new Earth simulator and we're going to get the fastest, best, most sophisticated model, the best team. But because we do that, we're going to only be able to make several model runs. We're not going to be able to fully specify the output of the model. Or you could say, we're going to take that money and we're going to invest in um, fully specifying an entire suite of outcomes related to a, a less sophisticated model that's not as computationally intensive so that we understand the full solution space of that model. So we know everything not what is probable, but everything that is possible. And there's an important difference between asking a decision maker to optimize their decision based on what you think is most probable versus asking a decision maker if their decision process is robust as compared to the entire spectrum of outcomes. My view is that more people in our community should spend time fully characterizing the solution space of their models. Um, with respect to hurricane landfalls, or and I'm sure this is familiar to many of you, I mean, if you're a very good hydrological modeler, you can probably provide me a model with whatever output I ask you to. Um, no floods, more floods, um, depending on how you vary the parameters. What really matters is the density of certain outcomes within that space and how that maps onto decision processes. Um, the decision maker should be able to answer the question, how robust are our, our our decisions compared to what could happen out there. Um, this is, so you go back to Grand Forks, 1997. Um, if it is indeed the case, and I don't know this, but this is what our report came up with, that scientifically nothing could have been said at that time um, to pin down the, the peak 
flood level um, to closer than plus or minus five feet. That is far more important information to the decision maker than telling them that the most likely value was 49 feet. Um, and I think that there are important science policy distinctions there as to how we would conduct science as to whether you're trying to come up with the best answer or the most comprehensive result. Um, so that's, I think, a very key difference. And we're, we're in a community where um, you, we have just seen it in the last week. Um, NOAA put out its State of the Climate report, which had these very selected individual studies that said the chances of a heat wave in Texas were 20 times um, in 2008 what they were in the 1960s. Well, that's one model, one realization. Um, doesn't tell us anything about uncertainty, and doesn't tell us anything about the distribution, and doesn't tell us anything about how farmers or others might think about these odds, um, because it fits with a media soundbite and into a, a narrative that had actually nothing to do with managing drought. Let's uh, go over here. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, I think that's a great point. The point is that good decisions don't always lead to good outcomes. Um, and unfortunately, the more um, high stakes and politicized the context is, the more closely outcomes will be associated. Um, in one sense, that's good from a democratic perspective because that will force people to say, um, how can we make it better? So you take um, airline crashes, um, which almost never occur in the United States, um, but statistically, they will occur. And every time there is one, the people are going to say, what went wrong here? How do we fix it? Um, and if you go in and say, well, yeah, well, you know, one in two million, it's just statistics, it's going to happen, um, we probably wouldn't think that's a very acceptable response. Um, I think that there's more action needed on the front end in trying to separate the distinction between giving advice and making decisions. Um, and you see this all the time in every field where the decision maker asks the expert well, what should I do? Should I evacuate? Should I let the water out of the dam? Should I buy the stock? Um, and we as a community have to learn that maybe one of our best roles is to either answer scientific questions that are posed to us by decision makers, complete with uncertainties and ignorance, or if they want information on decision options, which is perfectly acceptable advice, for us to say, all right, here's a suite of things you could do. And your job, is to select among those. I can't. So, you know, if you tell the, the mayor of East Grand Forks, well, you could build your levees on Elm Street, Maple Street, Washington Street um, at different costs, but I can't tell you what you do that. I can tell you what the consequences of, of doing that are. Um, and a lot of times it's very seductive um, and take risk management solutions, uh, which does a fantastic job of producing computer models that help companies assess their risk, um, got into the business of telling companies what they should be doing. Um, and now they're at the center of a lot of disputes. Sarush? No, I, it, yeah, well, no, in this sense, I'm not. Um, I mean, it's important to recognize that a decision is a prediction. Right. Anytime you make a decision, you choose one fork in the road over another, you're, you're predicting that taking that fork in the road is more likely to lead you to your destination than another. Um, in this case, what I mean is a prediction that's produced by methods of science as to some state in the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm not... Yeah, this is a great question, and it's something that we've actually looked at quite a bit in our research. Um, and the way I'd characterize it is that uh, in many cases, there's a difference, sometimes a very big difference, between what decision makers want and what decision makers need. And in our community, there is, particularly where 
there's tight uh, tight funding. Um, you want to be responsive to what decision makers want. But in in our community, this is where leadership is really important. There has to be the institutional ability for uh, scientists to be backed up when they say, I don't know. That's, that's a very important answer. Um, and if a decision maker says, well, damn it, I want that one number from the National Weather Service. Um, the way the wet National Weather Service stays out of trouble is it just tells the truth. And it says, well, our models are unable to distinguish between 45 feet and 55 feet. And that's the best science you're going to get. You can go out and pay somebody, and they'll give you one number. Um, but we're telling you that we're, we have no ability to generate skillful forecasts on that time frame. Um, on climate change and disasters, the IPCC could have just said, we don't have that evidence right now. Case closed. It, it, it would have been difficult for a short period politically, but it would have been right in the long run and caused them less trouble. Um, so I do think that there are a lot of incentives, um, and there's personal incentives. If, if I go out and say it's going to be 49 feet um, in uh, Grand Forks, uh, and it turns out to be 49 feet, then I'm the expert that the media is calling up next time. Um, this is just going on in Italy right now with the Lacqua uh, earthquake, um, that there's a scientist who uh, used radon gas or some other method to say there was an earthquake coming. Um, and the official experts said, don't worry about it, the risks are low. Um, now, I'm not an earthquake expert, but I'm, my sense is that the community doesn't think radon gas predicts earthquakes. But in this guaranteed winter scam hot hand fallacy, he was right this one time. So now he's the go-to guy. Um, we need a way institutionally to try to deal with these issues. The battles we get into in the media about science and pseudoscience and skeptics and alarmists and all this does not work in our favor for understanding a lot of these nuances and difficulties in using science and decision making. Right. Kind of too. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I mean, I would say, uh, there's two things I would say there. One is, um, you know, I learn more from people who actually make real world decisions than I do from scientists and textbooks and social scientists and all that, um, because they're actually in the fire of making decisions. Um, and I thought that the uh, the the, what I learned from the mayor of East Grand Forks was not that he didn't understand uncertainty, but that he fully understand the context that he was in. Um, now the folks in Grand Forks understood uncertainty because when they built their uh, levees to 49 feet, they built in two feet of freeboard, which didn't help because it was four feet and above. If they had had information from the scientific community, maybe they would have made different decisions. Um, this is where I think robust decision-making processes are important also. Not only do they help us avoid errors in science, they help us to avoid errors in decision-making. So the question is, um, how do you create decision process where all of our human processes for making bad decisions can be, can be reduced somewhat? And here's another example. If, if you're familiar with the Air France airplane crash that occurred on the Airbus um, from going from Brazil to Europe recently is because uh, the system wasn't designed in such a way that it set up an air. It wasn't that these guys were stupid, they were bad pilots. Um, it's that the, the cues that they were getting um, did not conform with the decisions they ought to make. It was not robust. And so that's hopefully now been fixed. But there's a lot of examples of that where um, the decisions that we make are not because people are stupid or do anything intentionally wrong that can be corrected through education is because the decision process design itself. Um, and this is something that I think is very difficult for people who are um, technical experts um, to, to have to deal with. Because what do you say, no, oh, I'm an expert in hydrology or climatology, and now all of a sudden you're telling me I have to know something about decision processes? Um, and the reply I have, and this is what I tell my students, is yes. If you want to be active in the decision making world, you damn well better know something about decision process, and you better know a lot about it, because that's the world you'll be inhabiting. Um, if you just want to publish papers and walk away, that's another thing altogether. But the minute that the community says something about fusing science and decision, um, the decision making gets elevated 
perhaps even above the science, because that's where the action is. There's a question here. Yeah, you know, this is a great question. Um, when there are issues that can be resolved through tools of science empirically, um, this is where expert advisory committees are so important. And the constituting of expert advisory committees in a way that reflects a diversity of points of view, not just on the science, but on issues like risk tolerance, um, is absolutely essential. During the Bush administration, um, they got into trouble in the Obama administration to a little bit less because they would call up scientific advisors and they say, we want you on this committee on drug regulation. Who did you vote for? Um, and the idea was that they were stacking them from the perspective of these extra scientific values to try to get some predetermined outcome. Um, this is why all of us, this again gets back to institutions and leadership, when we have expert advisory committees, we should say, do they have a balance, not just of expertise, do we have a water guy, an ecology guy, climate guy, uh, but these other messy, softer, uncomfortable issues. Um, and I think all of us can name expert advisory committees that we've been aware of that are tilted one way or another in terms of risk tolerance, for instance. Um, I, I, an example that I often highlight, um, the, the National Research Council did a big study on climate change called America's Climate Choices. And if you look at the composition of people um, who were on that, the scientists, every single one of them had come out advocating for cap and trade. There was nobody advocating for a carbon tax. Um, so not unpredictably, the results, the scientific results, um, were presented in a way that was consistent with a cap and trade regime. Um, was that by accident? I don't, I don't think so. So again, it, it gets to leadership, and, it, and, and I don't have a good answer for Sarusha's because sometimes if the, the decision makers you're talking to are expecting a certain outcome, if you say, well, I'm going to put together a balanced committee of people who are risk tolerant, um, and people who are risk takers, um, they might say, well, no, I don't, I don't want that. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I was asked by, by NASA about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I was at NCAR, to do a risk-benefit study on the deorbiting of the TRIM satellite, rainfall measurement satellite. Um, and the, the long story short is they had some fuel there that was going to be used to deorbit it, make sure it goes in the ocean and doesn't hit anybody's house. Um, what the scientists wanted to do was to use that fuel to keep it up in space um, in order to take more data. And then it would just fall uncontrolled. So the question they asked me to lead a workshop on was what are the risks and benefits versus getting more data versus an uncontrolled reentry. NASA scientists wanted that data. Um, I knew that when they funded me. Um, we did, I think, a straight up balanced result that said, well, given the uncertainties and so on, risk benefits aren't the basis for making this decision. Um, they went out and funded another study afterwards that said they should collect the data. And as a scientific community, this gets to how we think about democracy. Um, and it's very tempting to try to use our authority, our expertise as the basis for compelling decisions when we're just one factor in the bigger picture. And sometimes accepting that decision makers have the right to make the wrong decision um, can be difficult, but it's liberating also. Yeah, that's, that's a, an issue that's frequently raised across issues and it gets to how you think about democracy and expertise. Um, 
but I will say, I mean, just to take the example you ended there with, that the National Weather Service um, in the Grand Fork situation didn't even understand or appreciate the uncertainties in its own forecast at the time it was producing that 45-foot number, 49-foot number, because no one had asked. It wasn't important. It wasn't deemed to be important. Um, the, the uncertainty bounds on that number were calculated in the process of figuring out what went wrong. So simply having an expert in the position of being a decision maker doesn't guarantee that you're going to make good decisions anyway. Um, and again, given that decision makers have to make decisions on all sorts of topics, optimizing them for one set of issues doesn't really help all the other ones. So um, I'm, I'm with Winston Churchill on democracy. It's the worst system, except for all those others. Yeah, um, I mean, robustness includes with respect to politics. So I'll give you an example. Um, so one of my books, The Climate Fix, um, make an argument for how we should think about climate change in ways that are robust to the left-right Republican-Democrat debates that climate change has gotten wrapped up in. Um, and the way to do that is you appeal to common interests. In that case, appeal to the fact that the way that you replace dirty energy is with cleaner energy that costs less because people don't want to pay more for energy. Um, the second factor to realize is that the world is going to need a tremendous amount of new energy. And it doesn't matter what you think about climate change, um, somebody's going to be building power stations, a grid in India and China uh, and Africa eventually. Um, that's good for the US economy. Um, so I think framing issues in ways that meet common interest is a way to generate political robustness. Can't always be done, um, but it can be done, I think, in more cases than we allow it to. Thank you all very much. Where is the